The inspirational messages delivered by Reverend Kevin McCarthy on these videotapes were prepared for general audiences and aired originally as Word and Deed on cable television. Each of these talks is inspired by topics covered in the Unification Principle. Reverend McCarthy conducts educational and guidance programs throughout the world for the Education Department of the Unification Church. This program includes excerpts from Reverend Sun Myung Moon's talks and sermons delivered in the United States of America. I have found the study of unification theology extremely interesting and stimulating and enriching at several points. It's somewhat difficult to single out um, one above the others. Certainly the doctrine of creation is um, very significant. The doctrine of the fall I consider extremely important and timely. The, the doctrine of historical providence and restoration, centering in the understanding of the Messiah, is, has been of great interest to me. And in general, the eschatological perspective uh, and the way in which um, all of these doctrines cohere and bear upon the reality of the family and contemporary society, um, all of that has been very illuminating for me in my understanding of Christian tradition and the relevance of um, my own Christian faith in the contemporary world, and then particularly also a matter I'm very much interested in, the emerging uh, dialogue of world religions and uh, the possible uh, achievement of further unity among world traditions. In all of those ways, um, the study of unification Theology has, has uh, been very worthwhile for me. That I know that the unification theology is something that every Christian minister could very well read. I don't say acceptably, but I say you should read it for the information which it really gives, gives new interpretation of ideas that have become a kick with us. And I think that they would get plenty of new uh, ideas along that line. I think that unification theology touches into the very heart of what Christ and what man is about. The interest in this religion has to do with virtue. It also has to do with the restoration. It has to do also with the brotherhood of all people. It strikes me as I hear you talking about your responses to the divine principle that, that it's obviously a very sort of rich theological position and that coming from the various backgrounds that we all do, we of course sort of notice those things in the divine principle that, are, that have tended to be highlighted in the traditions out of which we've come. No. I concede, by the way, I think it's the most exciting theological work I've read in the last 20 years of my life. It's the most exciting. But <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our program. Last week we talked about the existence of God. And, uh, of course, we already knew God exists. We already believed in that. Uh, but also we found out that God is a personal God. That God uh, uh, has emotion, intellect, and will. And this means, uh, potentially, we should be able to talk to him, communicate with God, had, have give and take with God. And actually, uh, this is what prayer is all about. Prayer is give and take with God. Prayer is sharing my own heart, intellect, and will with the heart, intellect, and will of God. Have you all prayed? Yes. I hope so. <laughs> Prayer is good, isn't it? Uh, but has anyone ever seen you praying? And uh, there are a lot of people that maybe have seen you pray and didn't really understand what you were doing. When you pray, 
To someone who doesn't pray, it looks like you're talking to yourself. Right? <laughs> or it looks like you're talking to the wall. And uh, last week we learned why God is invisible. We can't see God with our five physical senses. We can't experience God with our five physical senses. But with our spiritual senses, we can communicate with God. And prayer is directing our spirit into union with God. So uh, if you just look at someone praying uh, with your physical eye, then it looks like they're talking to themselves or they're talking to the wall. But uh, actually, prayer is the way that we communicate with God. And uh, when you pray, if you're sensitive, you can really begin to feel uh, the Spirit of God, the presence of God. You can feel God's presence come down and join with you. And you can taste it and feel it. And it's a very beautiful, uplifting feeling. I wish everybody would pray in this world. If everyone prayed in this world, then uh, God could be much closer to this world. And the world would be different. The world would be a lot different. So what happens when you pray? <clears throat> John 4.24 says that God is a spirit and must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. <laughs> so when we pray, then our spirit, our spirit is having what we call give and take with God. Having give and take with God. Communication with God. And uh, when two elements communicate or have give and take, then uh, something happens. One, they come closer. They come closer together. <coughs> so through prayer, we're uplifted spiritually, emotionally. We feel an uplifting feeling when we pray. And the second thing that happens is we trade elements. We trade elements. So if we have a prayer life, a consistent prayer life, then we share elements with God, our parent. And that means we become more God-like in our own character. That means our character develops and becomes more shiny and more bright. <coughs> what does it mean when we say we become godlike? Does it mean we become know-it-alls? No, it means that we become more like our true self. Through prayer, we become more like our true self. So I want to talk tonight a little bit about the benefits of prayer. Why, in fact, we should pray. Sometimes our concept of prayer is so limited. Well, we pray before we eat. You know, you sit down at the table and you say a prayer. Or if you pray, already your prayer has been written by someone. For instance, uh, we just pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We just repeat. You know, that's a funny thing actually. Jesus didn't say, say this prayer. He said, pray in this manner. In this manner. So Jesus was trying to exemplify the heart that he was extending to Heavenly Father. So when he said, pray in this manner, he didn't mean just repeat these words and that is the kind of prayer life I want you to have. But he meant for us to exemplify, to uh, to exemplify the same heart towards God that he exemplified in his relationship with God. Actually, we can see in uh, the New Testament that Jesus' prayer life was really amazing. That many times he would pray all night. And characteristically, Jesus would pray with tears. So in the prayer of Jesus was his deepest heart. His heart was so much involved in his prayer life. So you can understand that the purpose of prayer ultimately is to bring 
our hearts into artistic contact with God's heart. That we really merge and have give and take and become one with the heart of God. And if we have that experience, it's an experience that you'll never forget. So far beyond just praying over your food or just repeating an already written and or existing prayer or just praying on Sunday at church, prayer is meant to be a life a life, a lifestyle. What are the benefits of prayer? One benefit is, I mentioned, prayer develops your character or develops your personality. Prayer develops your personality. <laughs> How come? Well, uh, by definition, prayer is give and take with God, sharing elements with God. And who created you? It was God. And who invented your unique personality? It's God. So when we pray to God, when we share our heart with God, then we're connecting to the very source of our identity, our original personality. That's why you can see that people that have a strong prayer life, they're very confident of who they are. And also their personality is very outgoing, very bright, and sparkling. <laughs> I look at Reverend Moon. I have to say he really has such a bright and sparkling personality. And I know it's because of his prayer life. Uh, when I've had the opportunities uh, to... Uh, pray with Reverend Moon. I'm really amazed at his heart in prayer. And so many times uh, when he prays, he automatically prays with tears. So the result of that kind of prayer life is a very pleasing and sparkling and bright personality. So uh, especially you that feel like you're a little bit shy and uh, uh, maybe your personality isn't so interesting then you should try prayer life. And you'll really see your personality developing, changing and developing. Rather than running to and fro for, to the, from one fashion to the next, rather than swaying from one peer pressure to the other to gain acceptance, why don't you find your true self and go to the source of your true self? And that's Heavenly Father. And through prayer, we can really, the, the real me, the real self, will emerge from within me. And I'm sure a lot of you have looked in the mirror and said, who is that person? Who am I? And the way to find out is connect to the source of who you are. There's another benefit of prayer. And uh, <coughs> prayer gives you the answer. <coughs> Prayer will give you the answer. Have you ever been confused and you've not known what to do? <laughs> Y'all laughing. You all must be confused a lot. <laughs> have you ever been in a fork in the road and you don't know which way to go? Many times we have problems that are beyond our capability to deal with them. It's important to pray about those things, to incorporate the power of prayer into your daily life into your problem-solving life. <laughs> to incorporate the power of prayer into problem-solving. And you'd be amazed. The real frustration of life is to try to solve our problems through our own ability and power. And I'm telling you folks, we just don't have it. We need to incorporate a higher power in order to solve our problems, in order to meet and overcome the challenges of life. And prayer will give us the answer. You know why? Because God's smart. <laughs> He's an intellectual. God is a real intellectual. <laughs> and you can get some good ideas from God, amazing ideas from God. Because uh, He knows. He knows. And also, 
if you've got a personal problem, if you have a personal problem, you ought to pray about it. Because God knows you better than you know yourself. You know, that's our frustration. We have a problem and then we try to figure it out. But the problem is we don't really know ourselves that well. But God knows you better than you know yourself. Scripture tells us that God knows the number of hairs on your head. That's intimate knowledge, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when you think that some of us, that number is changing every day, isn't it? <laughs> so that's intimate knowledge. God has intimate knowledge about you. And if you tap into the source of that knowledge, then uh, the answers will come. How to solve your problems. Also, prayer changes things. Prayer will change things. Prayer moves things. Prayer, if you direct your prayer toward a certain result, it'll happen. <laughs> That's why you got to be careful about the things that you pray for. It's such an absolute law that you have to be careful about what you pray for. and Make sure that what you pray for is really the will of God. Because prayer is such an absolute power. Prayer really brings the result. That's why you should pray for others. Don't pray for yourself. Don't pray selfishly. Because if you pray selfishly, you'll get those things. And then that's not good. Prayer is powerful. We have to understand the power even of just our thought. I'm sure you've read the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. The power of positive speaking, thinking positively, and speaking positively itself has a power. There are people that chant. They want something, they just chant for it, and it comes. Prayer is even more powerful than that. But our prayer should be always connected to the benefit of others, not the benefit of myself. It's not really right to pray for a new car. It's okay if you pray that I can get a new car. No, no, no. <laughs> That's okay. In other words, we have to elevate the direction of our prayer. God needs our prayer, don't you think? If we look at this world, there are so many people that need our prayer. And if you pray for others, then that prayer really will help them. It really affects them. It really benefits others. So uh, if people in your family are, are struggling or sick or having a difficult time, if you pray for them, you'll see the direct result. It's not your imagination. Try it. Say, okay, I'll try it for uh, 40 days, and then I want to see the result. And you will. You'll see the result of prayer. Prayer really works. It really changes things. <laughs> but it's important that your prayer is directed for the benefit of others uh, and for the benefit of God. <laughs> and also, prayer gives us life. <clears throat> gives us life. Now, I'm guilty of this myself. Whenever I feel a little run down, I go right to the coffee pot, right? Well, instead of drinking that coffee, we should learn to drink a cup of prayer. Because prayer will give you life. Why? Why does, that, why does prayer give you energy and light and zest and clarity? Well, because, again, you're having give and take with God. You're having give and take with the eternal spirit. The eternal spirit. God doesn't have to sleep. God doesn't need to eat. God doesn't get run down because God is a spirit, eternal. So God is eternal energy. And when we pray and connect to God, then we can receive that spiritual energy into our life. And we really need spiritual energy, don't we? 
Don't we sometimes we feel a little run down or exhausted or maybe a little emotionally down or depressed? That's the time to go into your closet where no one sees and then pray. And you really will feel refreshed and more energy and more zest. But most of all, if we can follow the example of Jesus and really with our heart connect to the heart of God, really understand and relate to the heart of God, even tearfully uh, sharing our heart with God and feeling the heart of God in prayer. God has certainly suffered many things, don't you think? Don't you think that God can understand your suffering? And together in prayer you can shed tears with Heavenly Father. And if you develop this part of your life, then you'll be a person of sparkling personality, a person who can find the answer and can solve your problems, a person of hope, a person that can help others in an unbelievable way, and a person full of life, full of zest, and full of clarity. Prayer helps us to be that kind of people. Shall we try it? Yes. That's why God is teaching us about prayer. And that's why 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Then let's develop our prayer life and become bright people of hope. God bless you and good night. Jesus prayed with God's compassionate heart with tears and for the accomplishment of God's will. Benefits of prayer develops personality, reveals the answer, changes things, and gives life. How's everyone? We have an interesting topic tonight. We're going to talk about um, man's spirit body and his physical body. Uh, we're all pretty much aware of our physical bodies, right? We know that we have a physical body. We have uh, five physical senses. Uh, we can see, we can uh, taste, we can touch smell and hear so we can all agree that we have um, a uh, physical body but what about this spiritual body we don't really uh, we're not so in touch with our spiritual body so let's draw a picture of it what do you think your spiritual body looks like Casper the friendly ghost <laughs> well your spiritual body looks just like your physical body Let's say this is your physical body. After I draw this, you'll realize that I'm not an artist. <laughs> Hopefully, actually, your physical body doesn't look like this. <laughs> well, let's say uh, your physical body looks like that. Actually, your spirit body looks just like your physical body. The same form and the same shape and the same, uh, same expression. So uh, some people wonder, well, gee, how can we recognize each other in the spiritual world when we go to the next world? Well, it'll be very easy because you look just like yourself. That, that's not so profound, is it? You look just like yourself. So don't think you'll look like Casper the Friendly Ghost or that you'll look like some sort of uh, energy wave in the spiritual world. So what's life like in the spiritual world with our spiritual body? Well, you know, your spiritual body also has five senses. They're spiritual senses, but they're not that different than your physical body. You can see spiritually, hear, taste, touch, and smell. The same uh, senses that you have in the physical world, you have in the spiritual world, but certainly because the spiritual world is a realm of great sensitivity, then uh, we experience that realm so much more completely. So in other words, we hear music so much more beautifully, we see colors so much more 
uh, vividly, and it's really a wonderful realm. Last week we talked about death. We said certainly our physical body will die, and that was the bad news. But our spirit body will live on, will live on. Our spirit body will live on. But how will it live on? This is the important thing. How will our eternal, what will be the quality of our, our eternal life? This is the important thing. And that's why we live here in this physical world. As we mentioned last week, our purpose is to develop or to grow our spirit. I'd like to talk a little bit about growth. Actually, this growth uh, principle is something that is involved in everything. Everything that exists has to go through a growing period. So, for instance, God told Adam and Eve to become perfect, to become fruitful. He didn't create them perfect. God doesn't create anything perfect, but he creates all things with the potential that must be realized. And the way potential is realized is through growth. So we say there are three stages of growth. There is a formation stage, a growth stage, and a completion stage. <coughs> All things have to go through three stages of growth in order to become perfect. Perfect. Now, what is perfection? Perfection, uh, we sort of misunderstand this word sometimes. It means like just, uh, well, sometimes if you, you want to give somebody a hard time, you say, oh, he thinks he's perfect. It has a certain connotation. But perfection, real perfection, as God created it, is simply, mean, it simply means that the purpose is fulfilled. For instance, a perfect apple tree is an apple tree that bears fruit, that bears fruit. So the purpose is fulfilled. A perfect squirrel is one that grows and becomes a mature and uh, uh, perfect squirrel by fulfilling its purpose. So man was to achieve perfection by fulfilling his purpose. So we need to grow spiritually. Now, physically, we grow through three stages, don't we? Childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. But also, spiritually, man must grow. Man must grow spiritually through three stages of growth in order to achieve uh, perfection or to fulfill his spiritual purpose uh, in this world. So how do we grow? Well, this is why we're living in a physical world. And this is why we have a physical body. This physical body that we have is like the soil in which our spirit grows. I think last week we uh, called the physical body the second womb. In the, in the physical world is the second womb. And your physical body is like a portable unit. It's a womb, your personal womb in which your own spirit can grow through three stages of growth to achieve spiritual perfection. So how does that happen? How does that happen? Well, it's just like, um, it's just like a, a banana growing on a banana tree. Your body is like the tree and the fruit is your spirit. And uh, your spirit gains a certain vitality, a certain nourishment from your physical body until a certain point. Then what happens to the banana? It separates from the tree. And so the same way, once we achieve spiritual perfection, we don't need to stay in the physical world anymore. Just like a baby, once it's fully developed after nine months, it doesn't need to stay in the womb, and it shouldn't stay in the womb. So how does this um, relationship take place, and how does our spirit actually grow? Well, we can see that our physical body grows, doesn't it? Certainly my physical body is growing a lot. Uh, unfortunately, if your physical bo body is growing, it doesn't necessarily mean your spiritual body is growing, right? 
But how does our um, physical body grow? Well, we, uh, we get a certain nourishment from uh, sunlight and air. We need good uh, sunlight. We need good, fresh air. Sometimes it's hard to get it in the city, isn't it? And uh, we call this positive physical elements. But also we need food and vitamins and nutrients. And uh, you have to do something. You have to take responsibility to get these sort of things for physical nourishment. And uh, these uh, positive and minus elements have interaction within our physical body. Our physical body develops. Our physical body develops. And um, our physical body passes to the spiritual body a certain kind of nourishing element. We call that a vitality element. Vitality element. Can you read that? Vitality element. This comes to our spirit from our physical body. <laughs> and this comes as a minus spiritual element. But also we need something else. We need life elements from God. So we have to put our spirit in an environment of God's love and truth. Spiritually, love and truth. Spiritually, love and truth is the same as, uh, or God's love and truth is the same to the spirit as sunlight and air is to the physical body. So God's love and truth. These are positive spiritual elements. This means just like what you're doing uh, right now. You're putting yourself in an environment where there's God's love and truth. Your spirit needs that kind of nourishment. You need to find an environment where your spirit can breathe. So we have to seek out God's love and truth in order that our spirit can be nourished. And these elements, vitality elements and life elements, give back to the physical body spirit elements. Spirit elements. So we see then a transfer between spirit and body of two kinds of elements, spirit elements and vitality elements. So this relationship between spirit and body is so, so vital and so important. So we have to have the right relationship between spirit and body. And that means that our spiritual purpose should be our chief motivator in life. What is our spiritual purpose? What is our spiritual purpose? What is the center of your spirit? That's that old heart. Your heart. That's the center of your spirit. So we could say that our spiritual purpose is the purpose of heart. And what is the direction of heart? For yourself? No, it's for the sake of others. To live for the sake of others. This has to be the chief motivating force in our life. If our spirit is going to grow. In other words, if this relationship between spirit and and body is going to take place. If spirit elements and good vitality elements are going to transfer, we have to have the right relationship between our spirit and our body. In order to have the right relationship, then our heart, our spiritual heart, has to be the chief motivator of all our activity, all our actions. That's what your body does, doesn't it? It does good, it does actions. It does actions. And your body should do good actions. Your body should do good actions. And what are good actions? Good actions are that which is motivated for the sake of others. So your body will never of itself inspire you to do goodness. It's only your spirit and your heart that motivates you to do something for the sake of others at the expense of yourself. Your body, if you just listen to your body, what will your body tell you? Sleep. Eat. Me. The purpose of the body is just self-maintenance. Self-maintenance. Instinct. You know, the body just seeks to maintain itself. So 
our spiritual purpose has to be our number one chief motivating purpose in life. So our heart is our guide in terms of our activity, our action, the actions of our body. So if we have this kind of good action, this kind of good action, then good vitality passes to our spirit, our spirit returns good spiritual elements, and we grow. We grow spiritually. And this means our heart grows. Our heart grows. The essence of spiritual growth isn't how many visions you can have, or how well you speak in tongues, or if you have automatic writing, or any of those things, or if you can prophesy. The essence of spiritual growth is the growth of your heart. The growth of your heart. That's the essence of, um, of spiritual growth, the growth of your heart. So our heart has to become a perfect heart while we're here on earth. Our heart has to become perfect. And what does it mean to have a perfect heart? What is a perfect heart? Who has a perfect heart? God, doesn't he? And what kind of heart does God have? He has a true parental heart. So our goal in life in this physical world is to create within ourselves a true parental heart. What is a true parental heart? It's the heart that is unconditional, sacrificial, unchanging. That is the goal of your life. That's better than even if you got three PhDs. If you could develop that kind of heart, an unconditional, sacrificial, loving heart, then you've achieved the purpose of this life on earth. You've achieved the greatest thing that, that can be achieved in this world, the development of a true parental heart. So uh, what did Jesus tell us uh, pertaining to this point? He said, um, he said uh, love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Is that just the person who uh, lives next to you? No, it's, your neighbor is every, every direction. In other words, love all people around you in an unconditional way. Jesus spoke about unconditional love. He said, don't just love your brother. He said, even the sinners can do that. Love the one who does evil against you. Love the one who hates you. Love the one who's praying against you. Jesus really taught us that tradition, that we have to love unconditionally. That in this life on earth, we have to develop that kind of true, parental, unconditional, unchanging, uh, sacrificial heart. And the reason is because, again, your heart is the guide to your spirit. So when your physical body drops, when you die, or as we explained last week, have the second birth, then your heart will be your God. Jesus said, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So where, what realm of uh, heaven is God dwelling? In the realm of true parental heart. That's where God is dwelling. So if we don't create that same kind of heart, can we expect to be in heaven with God? If our heart is just living for ourselves and God is living for the sake of others, then we won't go to that realm of life that uh, Reverend Moon described to be so beautiful. So wonderful. So then the best thing we could do in this world, right now that we've heard this message, is change the direction of our life. Change the direction of our life from self-centeredness to unselfishness. If that's all you accomplished in your life, you would live a successful life. That you could say, I live a life for the sake of others. I change the direction of my life not to live for myself, but to live for the sake of others. If you could accomplish that, you can guarantee that your heart will be moving towards the realm of a true parent. And being a true parent doesn't mean that you just love your own children, but you love in an unconditional way. As Jesus told us, where the treasure is, then your heart will be. So. Uh, Let's all then make a, uh, a conviction, a determination that from today we'll change the direction of our life. Don't live for myself. 
but instead, instead sacrifice myself for the sake of someone else, for the sake of others. That's the greatest degree that you could get. That's the greatest accomplishment, the greatest achievement that any human being could accomplish on earth, dedicating and living his life for the sake of others. Let's do it. Thank you very much. God bless. Spiritual growth requires spiritual food, God's love and truth, man's effort, Christ-like actions, and overcoming selfishness. My name is Daryl Bryan. I am a teacher of religion at the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario, in Canada. And I'm going to be moderating a discussion that is going to center on the teachings of the Reverend Sun Young Moon. And I have several distinguished colleagues who've joined me uh, for this uh, project. On my uh, immediate uh, far left, uh, Professor Frank Flynn, director of the graduate program in religion and education at St. Louis University, and author of a forthcoming study on the work of the so Canadian philosopher George Grant. Mm -hmm. Next to me, Professor Herbert Richardson, the University of Toronto, and author of many uh, books, uh, perhaps his most significant work being towards American theology. And on my right, Professor Richard Rubenstein, distinguished professor at Florida State University, author of many uh, books, uh, again, uh, to name one title, uh, The Cunning of History. These gentlemen have joined me today for a discussion of the, the divine significance of the human and of human struggle and of the inclusion of woman alongside man in that struggle and even children, even the importance of the period of childhood and coming to growth and coming to maturity. There's, it seems to me, where the thrust of unification uh, theology lies. We have rushed to become adults without paying attention to the whole slow, necessary stages in the developmental process of becoming fully human beings who can therefore be open to a spiritual or divine dimension. Now on that, now on that level, it seems to me, when we therefore think about uh, how religion has to deploy itself in the modern world, we see that the real threats to religion are precisely those movements, those secular movements that deny that human beings grow into spiritual beings, beings capable of a relationship with God, and a kind of secular insistence that human beings are nothing but biological, material beings, and the whole state apparatus that at present, for example, is declaring that people who have religious experience are brainwashed. Mm -hmm. Now that's why it seems to me Reverend Moon says that the real threat to human beings today is secularism, is materialism, a shorthand for that is communism. Communism, communism to me is like, uh, is like having a plant that grows up and then before it flowers you snip the bud off. The spiritual dimension is like the flowering head. And, uh, and by, by seeing man, in a certain sense the divine dimension is like the sun and the flower opens for the sun and communism wants to keep man only rooted in the soil. And, and, and I think that, that quite frankly, uh, there's information now coming in. Do you know what is growing in Russia? It's Pentecostalism, mm -hmm. which stresses this, this openness to the divine. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Um, one question that people ask me a lot, and maybe you've asked yourself this question, um, how is it possible that man could fall away from God? After all, doesn't Genesis 127 say very clearly, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, God created man. Male and female, he created them. <coughs> so how is it possible 
that man created in the image of God could become so messed up. Have you ever asked yourself that? How is it possible? Here we are, the supposedly the highest creation of God, and we're so messed up. And look at our history and uh, watch the evening news and all the things that we see. How is it possible that God's image could become like this? One thing we know, the way man has become certainly isn't the image of God. Uh, if we go to uh, the natural world, if uh, we go out to the creation, <coughs> for instance, if you've ever been to the uh, mountains in North Carolina, it's so beautiful. And uh, when you're out there in the beauty of creation, you can really feel that God's nature is so beautiful and loving and peaceful. But when we get into the midst of uh, man's world, uh, we see a big difference. That somehow the world, uh, the man's world, man's society, uh, really reflects so little of what God is. And yet God has created this man and woman as, as his image. So how is it possible that we see this diversion, that, that human beings were able to divert from God. After all, uh, we look at the creation and we have never seen, uh, uh, for instance, a squirrel that deviated from God's way. When you walk through uh, Central Park in the middle of the night, you're not worried about getting mugged by a squirrel, are you? <laughs> it's the human beings that are the problem. So. We look at everything in the creation, and everything seems to work perfectly. We see order and harmony and beauty and wonderful things throughout the creation, but when it gets to us, we're all messed up. <coughs> so we need to try to understand this tonight. How is it possible that man could divert from the way? And uh, what happened, actually? And uh, one thing that we see in common, man and the creation, is that actually, though man was created, we were not created complete or perfect. Now this doesn't mean that uh, man was created with some flaw in the beginning. But man was created with a potential. And this is a common principle. That nothing is created complete. Nothing is created complete. But everything is created with a certain potential that it must fulfill. And we say that all things must go through three stages of growth in order to fulfill their purpose. And in effect, that's what perfection is. <coughs> what is a perfect apple tree, for instance? A perfect apple tree is an apple tree that bears fruit, fulfills its purpose as an apple tree. That's what perfection is. So all things in creation, uh, the apple tree, for instance, begins not as a tree, it doesn't just come flying out of the sky, boom, apple tree. <laughs> but it has to go through a growing period. Three stages of growth. It goes, begins as a seed in the ground, goes through a formation, a growth, and then a completion stage, and then it bears fruit. It's a perfect apple tree. <laughs> and uh, this is true for everything in the creation, these three stages of growth in order for things to fulfill their purpose. This is true, and it's true for man as well. For instance, we can see externally, in terms of the growth of our body, uh, we go through a, <coughs> a childhood, an adolescence, and an adulthood. Um, but there's something more to man's growth that we want to talk about. And uh, <coughs> there's something about man's growth that is really different and unique from the way the creation grows. If we look at the creation, you'll never see anything in the creation deviate from its fundamental purpose. For instance, the bears will always be a bear, will always become a bear and live like a bear and be a bear and do what a bear does. A tree will always follow the way of trees. In that way, you could say that trees are so religious, so righteous, <laughs> so pure. You know, they follow the true way of the tree. <laughs> and... Uh, the rock is certainly a, the true way of the rock. Every rock is being totally obedient to the way of the rock. And, uh, you know, rocks are so obedient, aren't they? 
they'll just wait, won't they? They'll just stay and wait and wait and wait. They won't move an inch. You tell that rock, stay there, he'll stay there. That means you can trust a rock more than you can trust some people, right? <laughs> so throughout the creation, everything is growing because the essence of all things in the creation is what we call the force of principle. <coughs> the force of principle. The life force of principle is the essence of all things in the creation. So <clears throat> the force of principle is the force within all things in the creation that directs it to fulfilling its purpose. <clears throat> now, the difference between the creation and man is that this force of principle is not the essence of man. We are not controlled by this force of principle. <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, I feel a little bit sad about that. Maybe it would be a good idea if God placed within the essence of man this force of principle. And that way, we could fulfill our purpose and there would be no deviation, no sin possible. Good idea, right? Well, it's a good thing for you that I'm not God. <laughs> because if that was really God's plan, man would never be able to fulfill his purpose. What is the purpose of man? What is the perfection of man? And we've talked th about this before, past weeks. The purpose of man is the perfection of heart. <coughs> and the, therefore, the essence of man is heart. Our fundamental purpose is to perfect our heart. And this is what God meant when he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. Perfect our heart. And that when we perfect our heart, our heart becomes one with God the heart of God and the heart of man become one. We call that then the direct dominion. God directly controls man, not by principle, but by love. And before that, <coughs> God relates to man indirectly, indirectly through principle, through principle. <coughs> so man's purpose is the purpose of heart that we have a heart relationship with God. So therefore, we have to perfect our heart. So now we have a problem. Because uh, in order for man to have a perfect heart, it means that the force of principle cannot be at the essence of man, but instead another force. The force of love must be the essence of man. The force of love. The force of love is the essence of a human being. And uh, <clears throat> our potential to love is the same as God's, the same love quality. God gave us the same potential to experience the same love quality as God himself. But uh, this creates a problem because the essence of man is love. And yet man has to perfect his heart. But what's stronger if we compare these two forces? What is stronger, the force of principle or the force of love? Force of love, oh my goodness. The force of love is maybe, I don't know, a hundred times stronger than the force of principle. It's stronger. So God has a problem here. How do I direct a stronger force with a lesser force? In other words, the force of love, man's heart, has to follow this way of principle. It's the way of principle that guides all things to their fulfillment. So how can this way of principle, a fundamentally lesser force, direct a greater force? The answer is it can't. It's impossible. The, uh, the reality is, if we're just dealing with these two forces, then the nature of love is to divert from this way of principle. It's the nature of love to divert <clears throat> from this way of principle because it's a stronger force. This is why <clears throat> God did something. God did something about this situation. And you know what he did? <coughs> he gave man a commandment. Now, God didn't just give this commandment just because he loves giving commandments. 
and seeing man grovel. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> but he gave the commandment for a specific reason. And that is because man needs a, another power here in order to harmonize these two forces. We need another power. And this is uh, faith. Faith. The power of faith. So God introduced the commandment, which was, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or you'll die. And if you were with us earlier in the series, uh, actually uh, we studied very clearly that the meaning of the fruit is this premature love. Premature love. So God, the commandment that God gave was, don't go the way of multiplication before you go the way of fruitfulness. In other words, perfect your heart before you consummate your heart with each other between Adam and Eve. <coughs> so he introduced this commandment so that man could then relate to the commandment in faith. Faith. <coughs> if man could relate to the commandment in faith, and this is why God didn't explain. He didn't explain clearly. He just gave a commandment so that man could relate to this commandment in faith and there, thereby producing the power of faith or the, the force of faith. Faith is a very strong, very strong power. Jesus said that the uh, uh, faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. <laughs> so if man could have faith, if man could have faith in the commandment, then man's heart could perfect itself. <laughs> man's heart could follow the way of principle and be fulfilled, be perfect. <coughs> so there's another reason then why God did it this way. And that is because, again, man's purpose is, with God, is a love relationship. And in order for a love relationship to exist, there has to be two important elements. One is freedom, and the other is trust. Trust. So God could not dominate man and guarantee that man would just grow to perfection. But God related, orientated himself to man based on trust, a trusting relationship based on freedom and based on giving man a responsibility. You know, when you trust someone, you're giving that person a responsibility to uh, be true to your trust. And this is how God related to man, in trust, not by power, but by trust. Because ultimately, the ultimate destination is a love relationship. <coughs> a love relationship between God and man. And if you've experienced love, you know that without freedom, and without responsibility, and without trust, there is no such thing as a love relationship. So between man and God, those three things were important. Man had to have freedom. And, and man had to have freedom because uh, uh, man was created to be a giver of love. Can you love somebody that says, hey, love me right now. You must love me right now. Love is something you can't demand. Love can only come in an environment of freedom. So man needed freedom in order to grow his heart, in order to develop in love. Secondly, if man's going to have freedom, and it's going to be true freedom, then man needs responsibility to maintain that freedom, to be true, to be responsible for that freedom. And if man is going to be responsible, then man needs trust. It has to be a trust relationship. So for love to exist, those three things are important. Freedom, responsibility, and trust. So God gave man a responsibility in order to remain a free being. God gave man the responsibility to have faith in the commandment. So <clears throat> God didn't do it all. God gave man a responsibility for his own self-perfection. And this is the difference between human beings and the creation. We have a unique portion of responsibility. The responsibility of man is faith. 
faith in God's work. Without faith in God, <coughs> without faith <coughs> in the commandment, then uh, there was no way that man could really fulfill his potential. So together, man and God share the same vision and the same uh, goal to actually uh, create a perfect love relationship between God and man. So this is a very different view, actually, because we're saying that man does have <coughs> responsibility, and therefore the essence of our responsibility uh, is faith, to have faith. When we have faith in God, God can work. When we have faith, God's will is accomplished. And uh, because that is our responsibility, then the possibility exists that we can fail. So if we look at this world, we can see very clearly that man never perfected himself, never multiplied that perfection. Therefore, we can look to the essence of man's problem must have been faith. Man must have lost faith in the very beginning. And uh, if we study religious history, we can see always the, the central issue is faith. Even Jesus asked in Luke 18.8, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? So faith and relationship with God and man achieving our greatest potential go hand in hand. So then uh, let's become people of faith, faith in God. Thank you very much. God bless you. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. 